Looks like we're ready to go. So I'd like to welcome you all to the John Goldstein Memorial Lecture on Economics and Environmental Policy. John Goldstein was a distinguished alumnus of our economics PhD program who devoted his career to public service through his work on economics and environmental policy. To his family members that are participating by Zoom, I wanna say how pleased we are to be able to honor John's legacy through this lecture. And we want to thank Richard and Ellen Sander for their generosity in establishing this lecture series. This is the seventh in the series. And I, I took a lot, look over the topics and it wasn't very surprising to see that just about all of them were about climate and economics. And as I look around the room and I see all the young people here, well, that's not a surprise either, right? Because of the increasing impacts of this issue to come. We have a special speaker for our seventh in the series, Professor Catherine Hausman from the University of Michigan. Uh, I'm particularly happy to welcome her back to Minnesota. She's a native of Duluth, who had the good sense to come to the Twin Cities, to come to the U, to be an economics major and a Portuguese major, right? double major, um, star student, summa cum laude, took a couple of years to figure it out after she left, which is a, a good idea. But then she went off to graduate study at Berkeley before coming back to the Midwest for her professorship uh, at the University of Michigan's Ford School of Public Policy. She's produced an extensive body of research on environmental economics. And if you look at a record, uh, you're, I'm struck to, about this focus on challenges in the energy transition. Now, su suppose we could set a carbon tax of, I don't know, $300 uniform around the world, every source, a cement plant, a cow, whether it's in China or the US, right? Suppose we do that, I think we're done. You know, go back to whatever you're doing, problem solved. Uh, it's not working that way. And uh, uh, luckily we have a, a young scholars like uh, Katie Hausman figuring out these problems. And so let's give her a warm welcome as she shares the result, her research to us with us. Good evening. Um, it is a real pleasure to be back here. Go Gophers. Um, the only unpleasant part of my day was recreating the nightmares of like getting the bus to get back and forth, forth across the river on time. I still have nightmares about missing my bus across the river, but it is otherwise a great pleasure to be here. I wanna thank the econ department um, for their warm hospitality today and for having me back. Um, and it's, Great to be able to do this in honor of John Goldstein. Um, I think that economics for the public good is just a wonderful way to be able to use this toolkit that the econ department gave me. And so I'm really pleased that um, this lecture honors him and his commitment to doing that. I'd also like to um, dedicate some of my remarks today to the memory of Fernando Arenas, who was one of my professors in the Spanish and Portuguese department who passed away not too long ago and who had quite an influence on me as an undergraduate here. So I was at uh, an event recently where young people age 12 to 23 were asked what they are most afraid of. And I thought that they were going to say guns, to be honest. And it would have been understandable if they had. Most of them said climate change, which surprised me. Um, and also didn't surprise me. So if some of you out there are here because climate change is a source of anxiety for you or something that scares you into the future, I'd like to start with a little bit of optimism and say that I'm not so scared, I'm cautiously optimistic. In part because we have made tremendous progress in our policies to slow climate change. Here we have pictures, um, five different representations of that progress that we've made. Most recently in the United States with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act with tremendous investments dedicated to things like electric vehicles and solar and renewables. 
Below that on the right, you can see the rising portion of electricity generation in the United States that comes from wind and solar. And this is a result of decades of pushes at both the federal and state and local levels to invest in things like wind and solar. A very different approach has been taken in the European Union, um, which has a carbon cap and trade program. So to the point earlier, if we just had a carbon price, maybe everything would be easy and hunky-dory and we wouldn't need to have lectures anymore. We could talk about other pressing problems in the world. Um, the EU ETS is an ambitious cap and trade program, not yet at the level of stringency that most people would like to see to slow climate change, but still a tremendous step forward. And not just in terms of slowing emissions within the EU, but also in terms of showing how policies can really have an impact without damaging the economy. On the left, you see another example of that from our neighbors to the north. Um, where there are a number of pollution pricing programs specifically for carbon dioxide that have um, made quite an impact in Canada over the past decade. If we look back further in time, um, we, uh, you know, we don't have a national carbon price in the U.S. We rely on many other different kinds of policies, but we do have cap and trade um, programs in the U.S., most notably California, which you see here Governor Schwarzenegger signing into being. So we are making progress and yet there's a lot left to do, which is what keeps me up at night, what keeps me going. Um, if you look around the world, these are the jurisdictions that have some sort of pollution price on carbon. It might be a very low price, might be $2 per ton, just two orders of magnitude too low, but there's some sort of carbon price in lots of places, covering around one quarter of global GHG emissions. But of course, that leaves the other 75% of GHG emissions. And in many of these jurisdictions, the price is simply too low. The programs just are not stringent enough to get us to the level of decarbonization that we need. Another way of looking at that is just to see what carbon emissions are doing globally. So here is a time series graph from 1750 up to 2021, showing carbon emissions by country over time. And you, of course, see why we have the problem that we have today. And you also see why it, we have a continuing problem. Um, in part, it's because places like the United States, we're no longer really growing our emissions, but neither have we brought them to zero by any stretch. That's the blue area in the middle. The European Union has decreased its emissions. You can see the sort of peach color getting thinner over time, but again, still not down to zero. And of course, there are lots of places around the world that happily are seeing tremendous economic growth. We love to see this in China and other parts of Asia um, and parts of North and South America and Africa, where countries are rapidly developing their economies. But of course, that comes with increases in CO2 emissions as well. And the reason this matters um, is that it's going to very much impact future generations. And there's a disconnect here, right, between the policymakers who are leading the charge on CO2 pricing or carbon regulations or lack thereof, and then who bears the brunt of climate change. So on the left, you have climate stripes, the uh, visualization that some science communicators like to use. They show you average temperature across time in different years. And so you can very quickly see, very starkly, how average temperatures are increasing globally. Despite, you know, one-off years where they don't increase, they always come back up. And on the right, you see our choices going forward. Very high emission scenarios with very high temperatures, intermediate emission scenarios with still high temperatures, and even the very lowest emission scenarios still have rising temperatures simply, simply because of the stock of pollutants that we've already put into the atmosphere. So um, some of you in the audience are in the bottom generation group, um, and this may, you know, to date, this has already affected you. We've got 1.1 degrees Celsius um, or a couple degrees uh, Fahrenheit warming over the last 100 years. It's going to affect me. I'm in this middle generation. I turned 40 this year. Um, so my old age is going to be a lot hotter than my youth up in Duluth. Um, but for those who are being born right now, they're going to live all of their lives in a warming world, and in fact, a dramatically warming world. Um, and they're not the ones that are at the decision table right now. 
So we have a tremendous moral responsibility to think about these future generations and how our decisions around climate and energy transitions are going to impact them. The work that I have done for the most part has been about the energy sector. There are other contributors to climate change, I heard about agriculture, um, but I have focused mostly on the energy sector and for two reasons. One is that in the US, energy sectors contribute around 80% of our GHG emissions. So whether it's taking oil and gas out of the ground, um, whether it's burning coal or natural gas or oil in power plants or in industrial facilities, or whether it's us driving our cars around town, uh, all of this adds up to a great deal of greenhouse gas emissions. The other reason that I have focused on the energy sector in my work is just that it's an area where economists have a lot to contribute. You know, this is about markets. This is about supply and demand, and it's also about regulations. And it turns out economists have a lot of useful things to say about both markets and about regulations. Um, so it's an area where I hope that we can help really inform the debate. Some students asked me earlier today about interdisciplinary work in climate and what economists can do. And what I said, and I think this is true, is that this is a thorny problem that calls for bringing together people from lots of different disciplines. And I regularly work with applied physicists, with engineers, with geographers, um, we all need to come together to figure out what these um, problems are and how we can address them. But one area where I think as an economist I can contribute is to the understanding of markets. So for the rest of my time, I wanna look at what are some of the challenges that policymakers might face, will face in the energy transition. How have I thought about those problems and do I have any ideas on what kinds of tools we're going to need to solve those problems? So I'm not going to dig too deep into any one academic paper in the interest of giving you a broad set of ideas of how I think about things, um, but I'll throw up some links to papers by myself and by other people if you wanna follow up on like the nitty gritty details. So broadly speaking, the energy transition could be about decarbonizing the US economy. And doing that would mean getting away from a heck of a lot of fossil fuel combustion or else coming up with much cheaper and more effective ways to capture carbon emissions. Those are sort of our two options at the moment. Um, and so we're gonna look at today, oil and gas and electricity markets. Um, and I'll point you towards some of the research I've done on these markets. One reason I think the energy transition is hard is that it involves some externalities that were previously underappreciated. So I learned about externalities in my principles of econ class and then continued learning about them in like intermediate micro classes. Um, hopefully you all have had a class where you studied externalities to some extent. So we all sort of learn it, you know, maybe even in our first semester of our BA degree. But I think the magnitudes here and also the kinds of externalities we're talking about uh, have historically been underappreciated. So this example is an infrared image from the Environmental Defense Fund, and it's showing you methane leakage from oil and gas sites. I'll throw up some numbers in a minute, but it turns out that uh, a sizable chunk of our greenhouse gas emissions come from methane. And a sizable chunk of that comes from leaks from oil and gas systems. And this was historically, I think, a really underappreciated pollutant. Um, for a long time, academics didn't study it nearly as much as they studied CO2. And it's something the general public hasn't necessarily thought a whole lot about until maybe more recently. Also, the reason this is an infrared image is that methane, CH4, is odorless and invisible. If you're living next to this facility, it might not be something you ever notice. But it turns out the externalities from these methane emissions are really, really large. And they're sort of outsized relative to what you might learn in a Nucon 1 class. So roughly a third, the numbers vary and they depend on how you're measuring things. But let's say a third of US methane comes from the oil and gas sector. And the reason for that is natural gas is basically methane, the primary chemical component of the natural gas that we burn for cooking and heating is just CH4, is methane. 
So if you burn natural gas, you emit CO2. That's not great. But if you leak natural gas, you emit methane, which is much worse from a climate change perspective. It traps more heat in the atmosphere, especially over short time horizons, than does CO2. And over 2% of natural gas escapes from the supply chain. Different engineers have different numbers for how much over two. So let's just be conservative and say over two. It might be well over two. Over 2% 2 of natural gas escaping from the supply chain. From like a private cost perspective, that sounds pretty small. 2%, that's like rounding error, who cares? <laughs> um, I might lop off rounding error amounting to 2% in my calculations all the time. And so I think this is partly why this was an underappreciated externality historically. Because that 2%, when you add up all of the climate damages from it, it's tens of billions of dollars annually. I haven't put up a precise number because how we estimate that, there's like differing uh, ways to estimate that number. I didn't want to um, pin down any one specific number too much, but you're welcome to email me for a more precise number with many different assumptions going into how you calculate it. Tens of billions of dollars annually. So when you frame it that way, 2% of natural gas leaking from the supply chain starts to sound like kind of a lot. And that tens of billions of dollars, that's a number scientists have come up with to measure the economic damages and the damages to human well-being from climate change. So if you look at heat waves and how they translate into mortality, if you look at sea level rise and how it translates into coastal flooding, you can actually start to put a dollar value on that. It's an underestimate. It's hard to really account for all of the damages from climate change, um, but a conservative estimate would be tens of billions. So let's talk about regulations that have come up to try to address this problem of methane leaks, especially from the oil and gas sector. The Obama administration proposed a methane rule specifically on oil and gas related methane leaks. And the industry response was fairly predictable. I'll read out this first quote, which is from thehill.com. Drillers oppose the rules saying they are reducing emissions on their own because they have a financial incentive to capture as much methane as they can in order to put it on the market. So the argument from companies is, well, if my business is to sell natural gas, why would I let it leak? Then I'm letting my product leak out. I should capture those leaks and sell them on the market. So you don't need to regulate me because I already have that private financial incentive. And you see that same language popping up in lots of different uh, outlets. So this was not to pick on the Hill. Um, other outlets that I also regularly read said similar things. Washington Post talks about financial incentive. Um, Bloomberg talks about financial incentive. So the same talking points all around. Hopefully you can see the flaw in this argument. It doesn't take graduate school economics to spot the flaw in this argument. The flaw is that the private value to the industry of keeping the gas so that they can sell it is tiny compared to the externality. So econ one, you learn externalities, you draw up some graphs, they've got like triangles and rectangles and you calculate some dead weight loss. Here, those numbers for that deadweight loss are really big because the private incentive to keep that gas and sell it on the market is tiny compared to the social costs from climate change. The current commodity value of leaked gas, two to eight dollars per MCF, MCF thousand cubic feet. It's just a measurement of gas volume um, that you might contract on. Historically, it was, you know, maybe $3. The Russian invasion of Ukraine pushed it up to eight. It's back down again. So somewhere in that range and varying from year to year. But the climate change externality is like two orders of magnitude greater. One order to two orders of magnitude greater. So if I can come up with some smart technology that's going to capture leaks or prevent leaks from happening in the first place, if I go try to sell it to an oil and gas driller, um, $15 per MCF to implement this smart technology. They're, of course, not going to take me up on that because it'll save them 2 to $8. But society would like them to. It saves society over $100. So quantifying externalities and figuring out just how big they are and why financial incentives for private companies don't line up 
it's a really important thing for us to be doing as a society. That brings me to a separate set of papers that I have, separate line of research, really looking carefully at a specific part of the natural gas supply chain, which is the role of regulated utilities. Um, I would name the utilities so you like have a picture of who I'm talking about, but I don't want to call out any one utility specifically because this isn't, this isn't like the fault of one firm. This is just how things are set up, but picture whichever natural gas company you pay your monthly bills to. Most natural gas distribution utilities, so the ones that are serving us as customers, have fuel cost pass-through clauses in their regulations, right? So a utility will be regulated by a state commission that makes sure that the utility prices are fair and reasonable and that we're not all being overcharged for our gas. And in most places that fuel cost pass-through is set so that utilities can recover the cost of gas that they purchase as opposed to the cost of gas that they sell. And there are legal and, and historical reasons why the regulation is set up this way. It actually, it makes sense. If you've studied like natural monopolies and rate of return regulation in your econ class. It makes sense that this is what we do because we wanna make sure that utilities are made whole and able to recover all of their costs and that they don't go bankrupt. So this again comes back to the idea of underappreciated externalities in the past and then what it means for regulations going forward. Maybe we set up these fuel cost pass-through clauses uh, decades ago before we really understood how bad methane leaks are. But what they mean today is that I as a utility have no incentive from a cost perspective to prevent leaks because I'm going to get reimbursed for all of the gas that I bought, whether I sold it or leaked it. So that's a problem from a climate change perspective. And it's even starker than what I showed you on the previous slide where there was at least that two to $8 financial incentive. This is not to say that utilities are out just like leaking methane left and right willy nilly. Um, they do care a lot about safety, for instance. Methane leaks can also lead to explosions. So utilities do fix leaks. Um, but it means that their current incentive is around finding and repairing leaks that pose a safety hazard, and that might not be perfectly correlated with leaks that pose a climate hazard. So you really want them to be regulated for both. I had a long conversation this afternoon with somebody about regulated utilities, because I think this is a, a really important area um, for the energy transition. So I want to say a little bit more about these regulated utilities, whether they are natural gas or electricity providers or perhaps providers of both. Um, regulated utilities are an area where the rubber really meets the road on two big issues in the energy transition, stranded assets and the need for new infrastructure. We built all sorts of infrastructure. You know, at the same time that we were building highways, we were also building transmission lines and power plants and natural gas pipelines. We have all of this infrastructure sitting around and it was designed for a fossil fuel world. It wasn't designed for a decarbonized world. So some of that infrastructure we're not gonna wanna use anymore. And we're need, gonna need to replace it with new infrastructure that's gonna be expensive. So how do regulated utilities fit into that? A lot of proposed decarbonization scenarios, this is not mine, um, but this is similar to what you see from a number of different papers. And if you wanna follow up, you have the citation down at the bottom. A lot of proposed decarbonization policies rely on people like me disconnecting from natural gas altogether. The idea is that I buy a heat pump and I use that instead of my natural gas heater. I buy an induction stove, I use that instead of my natural gas stove. And the idea is you get, you know, millions of people in the US onto heat pumps, and then you power those heat pumps with renewables. And that's how we get to zero carbon. I'll just say, I haven't yet got a heat pump. I really value my natural gas, keeping my Michigan home warm uh, in cold winters. Um, but I can see the end goal here, and I can see why we want to electrify. So how does this transition scenario play out for a regulated natural gas utility? I mean, in this world, they don't, maybe they don't exist anymore. 
selling natural gas by the time we've got all these heat pumps in. But what happens in the transition where we're getting to that point of people having heat pumps? Regulated utilities have a whole bunch of fixed costs. All that infrastructure that I said that they built decades ago. Also infrastructure they built five years ago. They connected new homes to natural gas and new subdivisions. They built new pipelines to be able to do that. Um, they had leaky old cast iron pipelines. And so they replaced those with nice new pipelines that don't leak methane. When regulated utilities do that, they spread out those fixed costs, those infrastructure costs. And they spread them out across all ratepayers and across years because they don't want us as ratepayers to be suddenly hit with like one gigantic bill. Um, so there's this idea that you'll incrementally recover all of those infrastructure costs and that you'll spread it out across people. Well, that poses a problem in the energy transition. We are still paying off our old infrastructure for natural gas and for electricity. So now suppose, I don't know, 10% of people decide to electrify their homes. They install heat pumps, they install induction stoves, they install an electric hose dryer and an electric hot water heater, and they completely disconnect from natural gas. Then because their utility is still recovering all of these sunk costs from 30 years ago, what's going to happen to everybody else on the natural gas system? Prices are just going to go up unless we do something in the regulatory space to prevent it. This would be business as usual in a world where a lot of people electrify. So this poses equity questions, right? Who's going to install induction stoves? They're expensive. It's probably going to be high income households. So who sees rising natural gas prices in the interim? Probably low and middle income households. So this again is a space where the regulatory decisions we made based on what we cared about in um, fossil fuel markets decades ago, sort of coming home to roost uh, in terms of the energy transition. So in a paper that I have with Lucas Davis at UC Berkeley, we try to really quantify this and say, looking historically at how natural gas utilities have behaved, how much do we think that bills would rise? And we do this by leveraging what we call an econ, a quasi experiment or a natural experiment. We look for parts around the country where municipalities have lost population because of things like white flight historically or um, out migration from rural farm areas into cities, any, you know, any number of different demographic changes. And then we trace out what natural gas bills did for the remaining people who stayed in a city. And this is what we see, the fat blue line in the middle, um, is that prices rise exactly as is predicted. And if only a small percentage of residential customers defect, then this isn't a very big deal. But if we get the kind of large-scale electrification that decarbonization calls for, then you start to see really quite large bill impacts for people who haven't yet made that transition. To put more specifics on it, well, what kinds of costs are utilities still recovering? So the biggest, uh, single biggest line item on a bill would just be the cost of purchasing natural gas. And of course, that doesn't need to be done anymore. So that's a cost that can go away. But then you see lots of other different costs that don't go away when a customer electrifies. So utilities are still recovering old capital expenditure costs. They're gonna need to do that if, they don't, if we don't want them to go bankrupt. Um, they still have to pay off old pensions. Again, we need to do that unless we want to default on pension obligations or allow utilities to go bankrupt. And I don't think we want either of those outcomes. And now suppose that the 10% of people that electrify do it sort of in a geographically dispersed manner. So it's not like everybody on my dad's street switches over to electricity. It's like a couple of people do. Then you need to run the same pipelines down Main Street to serve remaining customers. And so maintenance costs don't really go down at all. All you save on are maintenance costs of the short spur that connects the main line to your home line. Um, so all of this is in the bucket of equity considerations. What happens during an energy transition with equity and justice considerations? And I hear in public discourse three different sort of tracks. They overlap, but they're not synonymous. Some of it is about environmental justice, which you see on the left-hand side. This is a picture from Detroit, near where I currently live. Some of it is about energy justice. 
this is a logo of a great podcast that I stole. You should listen to the podcast. So I feel less guilty about stealing their logo. And then on the right um, is a picture of young people advocating for climate justice. So how do I think about equity considerations? I think sometimes economists are sort of uh, accused of not caring about equity considerations or of not having good tools to deal with equity considerations. So I wanna say how I think about it, um, which is not how all economists think about it, but here's what I think about it. And this example comes from a paper joint with Sam Stolper, my colleague and friend at the University of Michigan. In this paper, we first lay out what we think the conventional wisdom in is, uh, the conventional wisdom in environmental economics for thinking about inequalities. Uh, this is what I was told in grad school by multiple wonderful advisors. So um, this is not to cast shade on anybody, um, but this is what I was told many times. Suppose you observe that a low-income household is exposed to a lot of pollution and then a high-income household lives in a beautiful, pristine neighborhood and doesn't get exposed to pollution. So an environmental justice advocate will say that that's unjust and that this needs to be rectified and that everybody should have access to the same environmental quality. And the conventional wisdom in environmental econ was to say, well, no, there isn't a policy failure here per se. It's just that some people have more income than others. Um, and so people are rationally making choices, trading off the money that they wanna spend on their house with the money that they want to spend on other things that matter to them, food or healthcare, um, things for their kids. And in that world, then there's no role for environmental policy in environmental injustices. There's just a role for income redistribution. And if you fix that, then you fix the problem. You hear the same logic being applied sometimes in energy policy and in climate policy. But what we focus in this paper on is part of what we think is a much broader point that economists would be uh, well to, would, would do well to consider, which is to say that there are existing market failures beyond income inequality and also existing policy failures and that those interact with income inequality in ways that exacerbate injustices. So the example we give in our paper is, suppose everybody's made their rational decision about where to live based on pollution levels that they observe. Um, and so you end up with low-income people living next to a refinery or a power plant. Well, what about the frequent case where we find out that the power plant or the refinery was actually emitting more than what they told us? or the pollutant that they were emitting actually does way more damage to our health than we thought. We knew it was bad for asthma, but we didn't realize it was also bad for our heart health or for cognition, for brain health. Then who uh, gets stuck with those unintended health consequences that they couldn't adequately incorporate into their decision-making? Of course, it's the low-income families who thought that they were making a rational decision about where to live based on tough trade-offs. So we argue that there are lots of cases where people underestimate pollution burdens and not through any fault of their own, just sort of lack of monitoring, lack of information about health damages, scientific progress is always trying to keep up with new pollutants. Um, and that this is an area where income inequality interacts with that very real market failure of inadequate information to exacerbate injustices can come up with lots of other examples. It needn't be income-based. You could think about racist, real, uh, racist realtor practices that would interact in the same ways um, to exacerbate racial injustices. A second reason that I think environmental economists and energy economists need to think about distributional outcomes is that climate policy is about fundamentally rejiggering very large energy markets where a lot of money is wrapped up in corporate behavior and in consumer behavior. And so climate policy is just inevitably going to lead to a redistribution of wealth. There's going to be winners and there's going to be losers as we transition from fossil fuels to a decarbonized economy. And so like it or not, we're creating distributional effects with our policy and we would do well to consider them ahead of time and to plan for them and to come up with um, cost-effective and also just ways of doing our decarbonization. 
Okay, so transitioning to a couple of other market failures um, and things that I think economists can contribute to this discussion. Um, another area, very different area, is research and development. Um, I have a policy proposal coming out on this next week, so I can't share it with you tonight, um, but look for it in a week on my website. And I argue that uh, another sort of Econ 1 market failure is really important. You probably learned in Econ 1 that there are innovation spillovers. So if I come up with a smart policy to decarbonize, somebody else might be able to make that same widget as me. And that decreases my own incentive for looking for smart new decarbonization widgets, that somebody else is going to reap some of those profits. So this is the justification given in any introductory economics textbook for government support of research and development. That, of course, doesn't necessarily need to mean that the government support for research and development would be focused on clean energy, although I argue that it should be for a number of reasons. But if you look worldwide, the United States uh, underinvests in R&D for energy relative to many of our peers in the OECD. So I think that there's real scope here for the U.S. to up its R&D and to do it in really smart ways following best practices um, to allow us the best shot of coming up with new energy technologies, whether they are new ways of producing electricity, new ways of capturing carbon, I'm sort of agnostic as to what kind of technologies it might lead to. I leave that to the smart engineers in the room, um, but I think this is an area where we could be doing a lot better as a country. And the last area where I think we could be doing better as a country is in modernizing the grid. This is um, related to the equity considerations I raised. It's also related to stranded assets and how we integrate and incorporate new technologies. To motivate it, I'm gonna show you a map. I didn't come up with this, but I really love this map. Researchers at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab tracked wholesale electricity prices around the country over many years. And they created for us this visualization of how often wholesale electricity prices go negative. Meaning if I'm a power plant, I will pay you to take my energy off my hands. That's a pretty funky set of supply and demand conditions that gets you to negative prices. And it's not 1% of the time. If you look in your neighbors, Iowa, maybe I should boo now, I don't know. Um, if you look in Iowa, you see that prices go negative in like a quarter or a fifth of hours. So this is a pervasive problem in certain states. You might say, well, it's not a problem. It's just markets doing what they do. But here's why it's a problem. Number one, you'll see that it's only in the middle part of the country. So while folks in Iowa are seeing these negative electricity prices, folks in Minneapolis or Chicago or Detroit are not seeing them. So there's the spatial mismatch. It leaves space for what economists call allocative efficiency to be improved. We could build more transmission lines. And it would mean that that really cheap power in Iowa would get to places like Detroit and Chicago. That's why I had a transmission line picture on the previous slide. So we've got negative electricity prices. We've only got them in some parts of the country. And if you are a renewables wonk, you'll know that that part of the country where we have negative prices is the windy part of the country where we're building a lot of wind turbines. So this is caused in large part by wind. It's also caused by inadequate transmission infrastructure. And it means that the incentives to build new wind in those places, the places where the wind potential is best and where those generators would make the most electricity, those incentives are too low because prices have already gone negative. So what we need to do is build transmission lines so that we get better price equilibrium across space that we bring down electricity prices in Detroit, which allows people to buy EVs and charge them on, charge their cars on the electric grid, and ups the prices in Iowa that gives incentive for new wind turbine development in Iowa. So why is this so hard to do? Like, why does this still, problem still exist? It turns out that there are many, many policy and market failures that prevent the build out of new transmission lines in the United States. 
This is a paper that Lucas Davis, again, um, one of my favorite co-authors, and Nancy Rose, another of my favorite co-authors, that we will have coming out um, within the next year or so. So sneak preview of one of our graphs. First, we went to actually quite a lot of bit of work to get that squiggly black line on the left, which tells you how much our national transmission system expanded from 2005 to 2020. Uh, and it only expanded by about a quarter. But decarbonization scenarios, um, including the Williams study that you saw earlier, plus um, a nice study that came out of Princeton and also a study from NREL, uh, National Lab again, all of these studies call for tremendous investments in our electricity grid to be able to decarbonize. They essentially say if everybody's going to drive an EV and everybody's going to have an induction stove and a heat pump, we need a lot more electricity generation and we also need many more uh, transmission lines. And so they're calling for a scale of investment in new gigawatt miles, that's a measure of transmission capacity, that's just unprecedented in the United States. But there's policy failures that prevent that new growth. There's market failures that prevent that new growth, which is what my co-authors and I are looking at in this new paper. So I think this is a really ripe area for policy involvement and also a really ripe area for research. So stepping back, uh, where does this all leave us? I gave you cautious cause for optimism that we've come up with lots of carbon mitigation, uh, you know, climate change mitigation policies and carbon reduction policies to date. I also gave you reasons to say that what we've done to date are not enough, that our fossil fuel emissions are still rising globally. And I said that for the sake of future generations, including some of you in this room and including my kids and also including me in my old age, we really need to tackle this problem before um, we get to sort of the worst effects of large scale climate change. And doing that is gonna require interdisciplinary research. It's gonna require stakeholders coming together across disciplinary lines and academia, coming together across policy line, uh, political divides um, in the policy space. It's going to require that academics and advocates and nonprofits and policymakers and business leaders all listen to one another and learn from each other. Um, and I think that that's really exciting work. I think it's really fun stuff to work on. Um, the intellectual challenges here are huge and that just gives people like me more sort of data sets and tricky problems to play around with. Um, but I encourage you all to think about how these things interact with whatever policy areas or academic areas you work on. Maybe you're a social policy person. There's lots of social policy people in my home department of the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. If what you work on is stuff like food aid for low-income households, you might want to also think about energy burdens and how regulated utilities play into that. If what you work on is international migration, then that's another area where climate change is really important. And we expect that future climate change is going to impact conflict globally and lead to changes in migration flows. Uh, maybe you're uh, you know, an industrial organization economist and you work on markets and supply and demand. And there's lots of interesting problems that you could contribute your intellectual expertise to to try to figure out you know, some of these challenges that I've highlighted. Um, and so I think it's an exciting area. I'm glad that the University of Minnesota gave me some of these tools that I've been using to, to tackle it, um, but there's a lot of work left to be done. <laughs>